I'm Errol Hyde. I'm a T10 paraplegic. I had a spinal injury in 1979. I came off a trail bike, a dirt bike, um, riding with mates up in Barrington Tops, up from Scone. So I guess I want to start just by asking you to tell us who you are, Errol. What, um, how, how would you describe yourself as someone you've met for the first time? What, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What, what excites you? Oh, I suppose I'm a fairly easygoing sort of a guy. I can be a bit impatient. Um, I'd try most things. I'd played a lot of sport as a kid, as a young man. I'd probably excelled in some ways in soccer and basketball and athletics. I was a hopeless student. Uh, so when I had the, my spinal injury, and uh, as you know, it takes time to adapt, to appreciate there's an opportunity to continue with life to get on and have a go. But for me, I had, a, had a, an amazing wife. We had three kids. The young fella had just turned nine prior to my injury and our twin girls turned seven just after that. And how old were you when you had the accident, Daryl? Uh, 34. I turned 35 in the spinal unit and um, they provided me with a nice ice cream cake for my birthday. Uh, wonderful people just up the road here at uh, the Royal North Shore Hospital level, level 7. Dr. John Yeo, JDO, was a medical director and has became a very good family friend. And a pretty famous person in the spinal cord injury space as well. Um, can you give us some insight into your life before you had your injury? So we talked about the fact you were already married with kids. What, what were you doing before from a career point of view before you had your injury and what was important to you before you had your injury? As I said, we had the, the three kids. I was riding dirt bikes, trail bikes. I'd raced some motocross. I wasn't that good at it, but I'd raced motocross and had, a, had an accident and busted my leg pretty badly. So I'd virtually given motorbikes away. I'd riding dirt bikes. And uh, some mates convinced me to get involved again, so I did some enduros and just trail riding, and I came off, as I said, up in Barrington Tops. Prior to that, I was, well, we'd been on holidays. Uh, the wife and the three kids were, had a panel van, and we'd been up to Noosa and back in this panel van back in 1979. And um, as was the want, the panel van, we had the mattress in the back, and we had a roof rack with a tent on and the three kids were sitting in the back and um, unrestrained uh, against all principles these days, but it was great. We, we uh, did all the um, tending stops all the way up and all the way back again and came back, loaded up the bikes and went up to Barrington Tops with the guys and that was, as I said, we're out in the trail there and off I came. I don't know why I came off. I wasn't going fast or hard. I was running in a new bike and... Um, that changed lots of things. I want to ask you about grief and loss in your life. And I'm, I'm asking in relation to your injury, but I know you, because I know you personally, I know you've experienced a lot of grief and loss in your life outside of your injury as well. So open for you to talk about that as well. But just want to, I guess, get an understanding from you of what, what grief and loss means to you. Well, I suppose it's a challenge of the spinal injury that... Um, you want to give it a go. You want to prove to your family and friends that you can make it. So that was pretty difficult. And um, as you'd know, well, I don't know exactly what happened to you, but as you would know that we, and I think for you and I, uh, our level of, level of injury, we're in the, probably the middle of the range. You can go lower and people have more function and you come higher and you have less and less and less. So our situations, as serious as they are or they were, for some, it's, it's much, much more serious. For others, you would say it's less serious, but they have to deal with exactly the same emotions that, that we have. They're, they've got a, perhaps a permanent uh, disability, a change of their life, what they, where they're going to go, what age they were at when it happened, what they were doing when it happened, how it happened. And there may be other, they may have multiple injuries. So if they busted an arm or a wrist or whatever, how do they get on with life, adapt to using a wheelchair, getting in and out of bed, where I could use my arms and my hands. Um, my back, the vertebrae were badly damaged and I needed three lots of surgery as it turned out. Um, and when I was in the Royal North Shore Hospital up here, they um, were just um, 
having the what they call the North Shore Games. So they took me down the I had a brace on and they took me down the down to see the Royal North Shore Games where um, people from the Prince Henry Hospital as it was then and Royal North Shore, <coughs> old and new clients, people from that paraplegic and quadriplegic sports uh, association came along and played sport where they were doing darchery where you, you um, used a bow and arrow to fire, shoot at a target or you were throwing a javelin a shot putt for discus. Uh, they were having races and they had some basketball and table tennis, etc., swimming, weightlifting. Um, and I met some amazing people then. So it's nothing to do with grief, but that was probably avoiding it. As I said, I'd played some sport and played it fairly well as a kid. Here I was in an adult. The only sport I was really doing was riding motorbikes that I, um, I took to the sport and had some great mentors at the time. Going back, I had a wonderful wife, a beautiful wife who gave me amazing support and encouragement, um, love and affection. And I met people who I learnt from, from not just talking to them, but listening to what they said and what they did, whether they were talking about getting in their car and then back then the wheelchairs um, were folding only. We didn't have quick release rear wheels, so I was taught to get into the passenger side of the car, to get in the car, take the foot plates off and the cushion off and fold it up, slide across the bench seat and pull it in. Things were so very, very much different. Um, but I was self-conscious of being in a wheelchair and I felt perhaps being treated uh, with a difference, uh, that people didn't teach speak to me or talk to me the same as they did prior to my injury. I was just um, apprehensive about going places and doing things because people looked at you and um, that took a while to adapt and adjust to. And in hindsight, we all look at one, one another whether we're in a wheelchair or not. Yeah, absolutely. When you had the injury, and I know this is going back some 40 odd years now, but did you have this great experience of, of loss in your life or, or what you weren't going to be able to do that kind of um, dominated your thinking early on? Was that something you had to overcome? Well, it probably worried me about my independence, um, how I was going to manage, how I was going to go back to work. I'd work in the car radio industry um, and electronic trades and I was managing a business and um, became a relief manager when people from different parts of the organisation went on holidays, I'd go and relieve them for the three or four weeks. And um, yeah, just getting on and doing what I was doing. That's what I said, I was on the holidays at the time, but I really um, wasn't able to go back and do what I'd been doing then. So we went on the pension, on the invalid pension it was then. And uh, so after my holiday pay had run out and whatever other funds that I was owed run out or we went on the pension and that was funny in itself that I was asked to go into the office in Blacktown to uh, see me and talk about my issue and my wife said it's no point going because it's on the first floor and they didn't have a lift. So that's when you started finding out a little bit about access and accessibility physically and intellectually. I think I take for granted so many of those access things nowadays. Obviously, the world was a different place when, when you had your injury dealing with things like that. But yeah. I guess, yeah, I just take for granted now that most places that I want to go are going to be accessible or have a lift or have a ramp. And 1981 was the International Year of the Disabled, and that changed a lot of things in that sense, as I said, physically or intellectually, where we communicated at a different level and for different reasons and more appropriately with the able-bodied community, you might say and you could park somewhere or get in somewhere or although some places would have a disabled toilet but they might have at a restaurant for instance they might have two steps to get in so different things happen um i just want to come back to that idea of of grief because that is something that a lot of people sort of struggle with when they have an injury and I don't know, people compare it to losing a loved one or something along those lines because of the functional loss that you Know, that you experience in your life and just wanting to understand a bit more about um, 
that, that grief process for you and whether that's something that you know you went through for a period of time and got past or whether that's something that continues do you still experience grief now in your life talk to me about grief well I think um, with a lot of bravado I sort of hid it hid that side of it that was an internal thing I had to show the family and friends that I was going to have a go and I could do this I cried I cried in private and I can remember the and I, can't, I don't know exactly what stage I was in the Royal North Shore. I was in bed for nine weeks and they'd moved me into one room, a private room, for whatever reason. I can't remember if I had a bug, but they moved me into this room. And for whatever reason, I think it was for about two days, every time someone walked in, I started crying. And I couldn't stop. They'd come into the room, a nurse or a sister, or a doctor would come. I'd start crying and I just I couldn't stop. But as I got through that, and then probably the months and years ahead, and I used to say a paraplegic could probably take a couple of years to, to get on top of it, to get your head around it, and quadriplegics probably four. Um, but at that stage, I couldn't stop crying those, for those two days. And I did cry on and off afterwards with my wife and privately, and not what I'd just done to myself, what I'd, I'd done to the wife and the kids, as I said, with our... The change in income and in um, the aspect of, of getting on with life. Here I was with the young kids, teaching them and showing them what to do. They were helping me cross the road. You know, as a dad, I was lying on the lounge. I had a lot of pain. I'd lie on the lounge and the kids would take off in the wheelchair and they'd be doing wheel stands and doing all that stuff out in the street. And he was, daddy was st still too scared to do a wheel stand without falling out, you know. So I, I know what you're saying with that sort of grief. Um, it's the pain and the not knowing what was necessarily ahead and how would you and your family continue to survive mm. as well as they had prior to that. Mm. And if you compare that um, experience and the process that you go through with that grief to you know, losing a loved one, which I know you've experienced as well, Errol, is it, is it a similar sort of thing or is it, um, you know, is it vastly different for you? No, it's totally different, I think. But, yeah. you know, I lost a son... We'd been in Japan and the message came through, he'd had an accident. we just um, lost a gold medal game to Japan and uh, the message came through. But anyway, that was very, very hard. Mm. Um, this was hard. Com completely different though, not, not even in the same uh, realm of, in terms of... You sort of, you see kids uh, crawl and they walk talk, teach him to cross the road, all that sort of thing when he was a kid and um, young fella. Um, you can't protect them there, they're doing their own thing, you know, he was 19. He was a pretty smart kid, he'd been ducks at school and he was a good athlete. But could have been anyone, I suppose. And your son, it's your son, it's your family, your kin. Um, so that was really, really hard. It took a, a long time to get my head around. And again, you hid that inside. You talk to people. I was doing lectures in primary and high schools then, and they'd ask, "Would you let your kids ride a motorbike?" You know. And he was. We end up losing our son. What I'd learnt was that wearing a full face helmet, if you came off and landed on your head, at the front of the helmet could or would hit your chest, maybe bust your sternum, but it would help protect your neck. So I told him, "Right, over you do, mate. What? Always wear a full face helmet." Well, he was doubling and. Uh, one of his mates coming back or no, going to a function and um, doubling his mate and they ran off the road. It wasn't no alcohol or drugs or speeding apparently and we're told. And his mate had a sprained ankle and he died from internal injuries. Um, so yes, yeah, so I said that was really, really hard. Very hard. Wow. Um, Errol, I want to ask you just about going back to your injury and I guess I want to ask, you talked about being that brave person for your family or that bravado and I guess that comes with a bit of masculinity in terms of you know, how you shield your family from those things that you're going through. But there must have been some personal growth opportunities that came or some positive things that came out of your injury. You're a very positive person, I'm, you know, I know from spending a bit of time with you in the past. And you know, w were there some things that you learned through your injury that you think were actually positive to you as a person? Oh, I don't know. I, um, as I said, I, would, I was a very poor student. 
I wouldn't say I wasn't bright, but I was bloody hopeless as a student. And I thrived on sport going back there in, in, uh, in high school and after, after school and we had a, uh, an Olympic um, athlete as a sports teacher in one of the schools I was at and he had us playing basketball and playing in adult groups after school and all that sort of thing. Sport, getting back to sport was one of the, the strongest aspects and there was, I had a, a wife as I said, the, the kids and I met other, other people and I learnt from other people and I suppose uh, in a way I avoided the able-bodied community. I felt more comfortable being with people who understood my situation whether it's how you went to the toilet or uh, how you got in and out of a car or that you got dressed lying in bed or sort of life, life went on. But the positives, positives of it, I learnt, I learnt from others and that's what I found in time, that's, that's what I wanted to do was to help and encourage others to give life a go. Some of them through sport, whether they played it briefly or they played it and became a... Uh, a good athlete st at state level or national level or international level, that was probably irrelevant in a way, but to join and to get in and have some fun. Um, this is a bit of a competition. You're competing against yourself to get on top of this situation and be a winner, um, to come out the other side. You know, to, to bat at your best, not that I was a good cricketer, but to give it a go and, and make sure that you, you and your family still got on and, and lived an effective and enjoyable life. You've been an, an incredible mentor to a lot of other people through sport, predominantly in, in my experience and getting to know you the times we've played together. But um, I guess in hearing what you're saying about helping other people and letting them see that you know it is worth living this life and, and you need to get up and have a go because there's plenty to live for, um, I'm, I guess I'm just fascinated by how much you've been able to give back in your journey and you obviously pointed out that that's something that you found that gave you sort of a, a strength of purpose in terms of helping other people. Mm. Um, I'm wondering whether there were any negative impacts on your sense of kind of meaning and, and purpose in life having your injury. Like, you know, you, you talked about the impact on your family and you know, being a breadwinner for your family and what you were able to provide. Were there, were there other, any, any other sort of negative impacts on how you felt about life and your sort of meaning and purpose in life? No, I don't think so. Um, as I said, I, it took me a couple of years probably to get my head around it. But during that time, the external facade was that I was having a go. I became president of the as I said, the paraplegic and quadriplegic sports association was, was, was then. I was railroaded into it actually. I went to this, the AGM. I hadn't nominated or anything and uh, one chap was stepping down and the next thing I realised I was the president of this little association and something I didn't want the responsibility of. I just wanted to play sport. And we've talked about you and I who've been fortunate enough to represent Australia. To me, sometimes the elite side of it is is probably promoted or um, acknowledged too much. I'd just like to see people getting in and, and having fun, whether it's hitting a tennis ball or bouncing a basketball or, or pushing around with some friends, playing table tennis, whatever it might be. And, and we've both seen people who've come along and, and played some port, sport for a while or said, G'day, how are you going? And they've got back into the workforce or they've had, sorry, got married and had children, done the lot. And I think they deserve medals just as much as someone who goes to an international or national competition and, and does well. I think you're right. There's, you know, we've, we've put that elite kind of achievement up on a pedestal, but really it's, it's about getting involved and, and having a go. And mm. we've both been fortunate enough to see what an impact that can make on somebody's life, even if they never reach state level or yep. international level. Just the fact that they've had a go and got involved in the relationships that come with that, the learning from other people like sure. yourself and that sort of mentoring. They had to get there somehow, they got to get home mm. somehow. They, there was a facility there, they had to get into it. We're talking about people in our case who are in wheelchairs, that they have to find it, they had to get in there, they had to meet the people, hi, I'm so and so, I'm here to do this or so do that. So it helps build the confidence and the opportunity to, to do more. To get them out of their shell a bit. 
because I, sure. I know I felt exactly. pretty shell shocked when I had my injury and uh, didn't want to. So engage. you were a kid, sixteen or something, were you? Eighteen, yeah. yeah. And I didn't want to engage with anybody else, and it, it was only through sport that I had that. Yeah, you know, I was kind of forced to, as you say, introduce myself, meet new people. Yeah, of. like I said, I was very self-conscious. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I want to come back to this idea of, of meaning and purpose and get a sense from you now at this stage in your life. What makes life meaningful for you now? What, what gets you up in the morning? What, what are you passionate about now, Errol? With the COVID virus, <laughs> and I'm an old bloke in that age group, um, uh, getting up. I'm living on my own now. Um, you probably know that lost, we lost our daughter in 2008 to breast cancer and uh, took on raising um, her daughters. Um, and then I lost my wife. They'd been both diagnosed in 2004 with their illnesses and um, associated treatment. The daughter came good, but then the cancer came back, breast cancer. And my wife had a stomach tumor, a tumor and lost her on the 21st of September 2010. So I was left with one of the daughters, uh, granddaughter. Chelsea. Chelsea, who was just turned nine, I think. So I raised her for nine years. And so if I, if I hadn't had, had to raise her, I don't know if I could have got out of bed. So that was a, a responsibility that... I did for nine years. She's now doing uni and living down in Campbelltown, uh, doing uh, occupational therapy. Uh, so that got me out of bed. Now I get out of bed because no one's going to bring me a cup of coffee or a slice of toast in bed anymore. Not that she did. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my wife spoilt me. Um, so um, I get up and this morning I made a cup of coffee. I got the pancake mix and I put some water in it and I made myself a couple of pancakes. Oh, I'm sorry, I fed the dog so and the cat first. Well. <laughs> I fed the dog and the cat first. And the dog is, um, Chelsea's my granddaughter's and um, that she wanted and we got her in 2014. And I fed the fish and, uh, and then I had my pancakes, my coffee and my multivitamin, my probiotic and my <laughs> blood pressure tablet. And... Um, Oh, my Metamucil, <laughs> and uh, a bit of butter and some maple oh, maple syrup. Um, what gets me out of bed? Well, what, life, what is it that you're passionate about, Errol? Life I know goes you, on. I'm, I'm not that passionate about anything anymore. But you spend anymore. so much time giving back to this community yeah, no, of people that we're a part no, of and being a, a mentor to others. And my immediate sort of um, expectation when I ask you that question is, you must be passionate about that because you dedicate so much time and effort and energy in your life to helping other people like mm. me to progress in life mm. after a spinal cord injury. No, I just, Surely that's important to you. Just life goes on. I'm, I'm probably a, a very or quite a private person, really. Um, if I've got a passion, it's con the concern of, of those friends that, and mentors that I, I'd had. Some of we've lost people that guided me, Kevin Betts. Um, Bobby McIntyre was a Queenslander, a great basketballer. Vic Reynoldson was JD. Yeah, yeah. What amazing little fella he yeah. was! You know, took him to his first basketball competition down in down in Albury or somewhere, and he okay. wanted to do this and wanted to do that, and what a you know, amazing young fellow! And then he gets bloody cancer and overcomes it, makes the Australian team, gets cooked. Anyway. Um, but you had such a big impact on people like JD's life and in terms of helping them get the most yeah. out of life. I don't know. I, um, I've met some, I haven't met too many people that I haven't liked. Um, I, <laughs> I'll probably say there's a couple I thought who used this situation to benefit themselves by and being a bit lazy by asking other people, even me, could I pump up their tyre or could I change their tube when they've been in a wheelchair, you know, whether they're an athlete or a, I don't know if they're lazy, anyway. But <laughs> most people will in, endeavour to be self-sufficient. You know, we talk about being independent. I think it, for you and I it's self-sufficient because there's so many, many things that I used to do and you used to do, but as a husband and a father, suddenly became very, very difficult to do or took longer to do, or, um, whether that's tasks around the home. When we get home with the kids, the kids were young, as I said, when 
Then and they'd be asleep in the car. We used to pick them up and carry them inside. That sure. didn't that didn't happen anymore. I yeah. don't know what you do. Wake them up. I don't have yeah, a choice. Wake them up, yeah, wake them up. And it just it just seemed wrong to wake them up and, yeah. and take them inside when you'd be doing something in a particular way. But who cleans the gutters at your house? You, yeah, obviously not me. Someone else? Yeah. <laughs> well, that was jobs that, things that I used to do. Yeah, sure. And my wife took a lot on a lot of those tasks. I can't remember if she cleaned the gutters or not, but she yeah. loved mowing the lawn. She'd put a little bloody headband on and out she'd go and come in in a lather of sweat and I'd be... <laughs> sitting inside reading the paper or doing whatever I was doing. Uh, it was a great, and she took on a lot of those roles and the banking and the finance and stuff, things like computer. I mean, I was computer illiterate. When I lost her, I had to learn a lot of those things and the banking and the auto pays and all that sort of stuff. And the modern things that we've got now, I mean, our phones, you know, they're just amazing. All I wanted to do was have a phone that you could, hello, Yes, how are you today? Thank you very much. I'll see you later. But now it's a computer in your yeah. in your it's hand and you take photos. I used to love camera, taking photos. Went to a lot of tournaments and the kids camps at Cumberland College, photo, 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 and you zoom in, you do this. Now you just pull the phone out yeah. and you take a photo, it's all in one. which I still do, mm. but it's not the same as carrying that thing around your neck and doing all the things that we used to do. Some of the basketball tournaments, whether it's in China, Japan, England, Spain, Hong Kong, Canada, so on, photos, all these photos. And got mm. albums at home with these, all these photos. And that was then, back going back, when you had rolls of film was a challenge. Yeah. And you didn't know what you had until it was processed. <laughs> now you can say, well, that was a, not such a good shot. Delete I'll that take one. another one. Yeah. <laughs> Nick, can you look at me, please? Click. <laughs> um, Errol, I want to know, if there was anything that you identified after your injury as something that you needed to work on, as in personal traits or even physical things, what, what, you know, what were the things that you kind of, in your moments of reflection, realised, hey, I need to actually work on this or be better at this? Patience. Yeah? If you're watching someone do something, putting that photo frame up there, that painting, wherever it is, and they're trying to put the nail in, could have been the wife, could have been someone else. Yeah these days um, and you're just getting a little bit frustrated because it's so easy to do that, to get up there to do that and uh, you've got to ask someone else to do it. And there's some things now around the place that I've got to pay someone to do it that I should be able to do. I've had one daughter, the remaining daughter, she's been coming over and, and doing jobs around the house and she's quite fastidious with what she does. She's got schizophrenia. So she's on medication and some of the way she looks at things and processes things is different to what the general community might um, uh, go about doing it. But she's been coming, excuse me, coming over and doing things um, that uh, has been very helpful. Mind you, I give her some money and um, helps her along the, way, on, along the way. We just bought her a little car. Um, a uh, little uh, 2001 Toyota Corolla Seeker and uh, didn't pay a lot of money for it, 2700 and she thinks it's the ant's pants. <laughs> and um, in her past driving, she's 48 now, in her past driving days and hopefully not these days, she um, was a racing driver. Not really, but <laughs> <laughs> I think she thought she was and yeah, she okay. used to give her cars a hard time the thrashing but um, uh, she's been doing things around the place and that's okay. been really helpful Errol you've talked about some of those um, what to me are really famous names in the sporting community as being friends and mentors of yours along the way I want to understand as you look back on your life now what friendships have been really important to you and, and what makes them important and that's what you say when you say that was um, yeah, guidance, encouragement, um, the mentors, and the friendship is is very important. Uh, Terry Mason, um, Jeff Simmons, and Terry's had two strokes, so he's in a he's in a aged care now. It's too difficult to live at home. Needs to be hoisted in and out of bed, and he was the same same age, similar level to me. Um, and so he's now in this, I visit him every fortnight. I was, went and visited him on Saturday and it's back to one hour again, sign in and do all, all the things. Um, and another mate, Jeff Simmons, who was also a Paralympian, a swimmer, his shoulders are gone. So now he's being hoisted and in a power chair. 
but you knew those guys when they were at the peak of their powers and you know terry was welding chairs for other athletes to be able exactly. to participate yeah. so, so what was it that was so special about those relationships because i mean you've often talked to me about how those people helped you to kind of navigate the path for yourself yeah. what made those relationships special to you watching and listening and and i said yeah just the friendship and it's um meeting a man and i've met women who are also quite inspirational but that's i suppose the word they inspired me to to do more to try harder um, they talked about the folding wheelchair and the two-door car and sliding their seat forward and rolling the wheelchair in behind them and away they go the things that they did some of them some of the hand controls with the cable would break and so they couldn't drive it anymore and they'd have to get out and try and signal someone to uh, to come and give them a hand because you didn't have phones to to call and say, hi, I'm here, can you come and get me? Um, well, they showed me the way, I think, and um, even though they were on the latter end, if that's the right word, of their sporting career, and Terry uh, had played us quite a few sports, Jeff was a swimmer, as I said, back in those days, the sporting arena, you could compete nationally and internationally in three or four sports. Um, and Terry did uh, table tennis, weightlifting, archery, as I came along, that's when you were starting to specialise. With the Paraplegic and Quadriplegic Sports Association, with all those sports, we were all encouraged to go along and enter as many sports as possible to make up the numbers because there wasn't a lot of us. So you'd throw the javelin and do the discus. You'd go swimming, and I swam against Jeff Simmons and, um, at the North Shore Games, and it was two laps. So down I go, I'm swimming down the first lap, I dropped my chewing gum and I was yak, yakking away. I got to the end and I looked around to see where he was and he was back down the other end. <laughs> <laughs> I went to my first national games were in Perth the same year as my injury in the September of the year of the, the, uh, my injury. Wow, you got into it pretty quickly then, and, um, same year. That was an experience and I, got a, I, I came third in the uh, tables tennis doubles with Terry and third in the uh, javelin. And um, I won't leave it till the end, but there was only three in each one. So, <laughs> so I came home with these bronze medals and bronze everyone medals. thought I was fantastic. <laughs> oh, yeah. It sounds like you had some pretty incredible friendships through those experiences, Errol, but I want to talk to you about the friends you had before you had your injury and whether having your injury had an impact on those friendships or whether those friendships weren't even viable anymore or did they change or what happened with the friends you had when you had your injury? Oh, that, I, as I said, I sort of avoid, avoided, started to avoid the able-bodied world. I, I just felt, I didn't feel comfortable. And whilst friends in the work area, the, the people that I'd worked with, the companies that I'd worked with and the people that I'd rode motorbikes with, both, they both raised money for it. And so that paid for the company car that I had, that paid for air conditioners in the house and, and some, uh, quite a variety of things. Um, I just found it difficult to relate or keep relating to the able-bodied world. Hi, how are you going today? Good, thanks. And then they'd bend down and you'd hear their knees creaking. And um, so I, I just felt more comfortable and I, I could learn more. I could be understood better. Um, by people that I associated with, like Terry Mason, Jeff Simmons, I said Vic Reynoldson. And, and was that pretty soon after your injury that you felt that way? I mean, the reason I'm asking is because I mm. had the opposite experience where I had my injury and I felt like I was in this state of denial and didn't want to associate with other people with disabilities no. because then I was accepting that I was disabled and I had to no. hang out with other guys in chairs. So I kind of, it took me a few years to actually realize the value in the relationships that I could have with other people in a similar circumstance. Yeah. And I feel like I lost some time and that I didn't, I was too busy pushing back on having friendships with other people in chairs initially. When you did the opposite, you gravitated well, towards I think, yeah, people. being, and what had happened too, I, um, I did my, I went to Royal North Shore, as I said, it was five months. And then it was Mount Wilga, which is now a private hospital up at Hornsby. So I went there five days a week for quite a while and they had, people with all sorts of disabilities there, um, all sorts. So whether it's a sight impaired or cerebral palsy or amputees or you know, paraplegic and quadriplegics. Quadriplegics often 
if they're out of town, live there. I had a mate there that I went through with who became a very good track athlete, Fabian Blackman. He lived there. His parents were up in Springwood, so it was too far to come back with some forwards every day. So I forget how long he lived there, but he lived in there. But he lived there for quite some time. But um, I don't know. I associated with... I just adapted better to understanding people that I could learn off and do things with. Yeah. And by doing those things, and particularly playing sport, whether I was bouncing a ball as I was bouncing the ball or hitting a tennis ball as, as it also became a, uh, an area that I became involved with, I was learning to use my body and to control the chair at the same time. You could let go of the wheels as a lot of people would just hang onto the push rims and give the little short pushes. I started to adapt. As I said, I was 35 and it was just one of those things that I felt more comfortable around people that understood why sure. I was doing what I was doing. Okay, that's interesting. I want to find out from you what activities you find meaningful now that you're not as active in your sporting pursuits as, as you used to be. Is there, are there things in your life right now that you find really meaningful from an activity point of view? Like I've discovered golf recently and you know, I'm obviously retired from international wheelchair basketball, but I've discovered golf as kind of my post-basketball sport and that really motivates me and energizes me to get out and you know, do something active still. Have you got something like that at the moment in your life that you feel are meaningful activities for you now? Golf? <laughs> See, I couldn't think of anything worse. It's like my <laughs> like going people. Nick Morozov went rock climbing, so there's photos of Nick. Photograph why of would you, when you... Hanging from that cliff, holding his wheelchair you, beneath him. Yeah. Here we are, going to look after our bodies. You make a mistake. I've had six broken legs over the years and bouts wow. of cellulitis and different things. Hospitalised and uh, for a while and taken out of action. And I think rock climbing and then <laughs> golf. Um, why would you want to play golf in a wheelchair? Are you allowed to go on the green? Yeah, I've got a special, special chair that gets onto special the green. Special chair? Yeah, yeah. designed Spe for it. Special able bods to help you? <laughs> no, no. no. It's, it's independent. But um, yeah, I would never have imagined while I was playing basketball being obsessed with golf. But it's kind of that thing that's I've yeah. discovered afterwards that... Yeah. You know, I really enjoy being outdoors because all of our sort of, yeah. I didn't play as much tennis as you, but all of our basketball careers was indoors. Mm. And now I've discovered a sport I can do outdoors yeah, and yeah. appreciate nature yeah. and appreciate beautiful yeah. winter's days kind of outdoors. And yeah. that really gives me a bit of, I guess, it refreshes my soul when yeah. I get out there and do, excellent. You know, spend, yeah. spend the afternoon outdoors. And that's the thing, there is a variety. And mm. you've got the opportunity. So someone gave you the opportunity or you're allowed to, to use the facility, um, thanks to pioneers. Going like way back, going using basketball stadiums, we were frowned on because the older chairs had the foot plates hanging down. Oh, when yeah. people fell out, they took big gouges out the of floor. the floor. Yeah, and okay. If you went to use the toilet, you couldn't get in because they didn't have disabled toilets. Or yeah. if you, you went to comb your hair, the mirror was up here and you couldn't see yourself <laughs> properly until things changed. But yeah, golf, um, and there's lots and lots of sports that a small group might play or mm. try. Um, what is it for you though? What, what, is, what do you enjoy I, I doing in this, this just, phase I of hand, your life? I've handled, hand cycled a bit, which okay. I enjoyed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I walked the dog, loved the dog. Took the dog for a walk this morning. Yeah. And I, so I pushed about two kilometres just around and she runs here, runs there and sniffs here and sniffs there. I've got to be careful in the summertime because there's snakes in the area where we go. Yeah, okay. But just... Um, Walking the dog. Um, yeah, that's. I, I guess those are the kind of things I was asking about, getting out and, yeah. you know. I haven't had a hit of tennis for a long time. In fact, it hurts a little bit sometimes if I hit the ball too, too hard or reach too hard. I've got to go have a good stretch and a warm-up before I do too much exercise. It's hard not to be competitive after all those years of trying to win. You want to get out there and be yeah. competitive, I imagine that. Yeah, I had a, I'm sure I had a hit with you one, one time, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. You yeah, hit the ball have, really well. We did have a hit. And I don't know why you don't play tennis with <laughs> Sonia. <laughs> because hey. I've discovered golf, Errol. <laughs> hey. Does she play <laughs> golf? Um, she's just started having lessons. I've convinced her that we've got two kids and with me and her and two kids, that's a four ball on a golf course, so it's perfect. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Um, Errol, I've got another question for you. It's kind of the last question before I give you the opportunity just to share whatever you'd like to from your experience. But I want to know, and this is hypothetical, but if you had the opportunity to go back 
and change the course of history so that you didn't have your injury, would you do it? Absolutely. I don't, I don't particularly like being in a wheelchair. Okay. Um, and having walked, started walking at nine months, I'm told, yeah. uh, having walked for 34 years, um, there's no comparison. This is, this is tough. It's really tough. I absolutely agree with you, but I guess I then the follow-up question to that is what would you have lost by changing the course of history? You've done so much. You've lived such a rich and rewarding life and travelled the world and played sports at an elite level and all of these things that you've done. Are you prepared to give those up? To yeah, go I'd forgo and... all that, be able to, to walk you and would. To, to have that freedom of movement, mm. whether it's to run, jump, skip, hop, as I said, pick up the kids and carry them, just tasks around the house that yep. my wife had to do or we had to pay for someone else to do it, whether it was cleaning the gutters or whatever yeah. it might have been. Um, you forgo all of that. And yet I know some people that they are happy with their situation. Mm. And I was asked recently, would I, um, no, I don't put the word prefer, but would I prefer to be born with a disability or have one later in life? And that was a hard question. I actually, um, I gave them the answer eventually, but I, no, I didn't. I said, no, that's too hard, sorry. Okay. The lady I was talking to had late onset muscular dystrophy. She may eventually die, not in the not too distant future. A lovely, lovely, lovely lady whose sister had died from the same disease. And I'd been in the wheelchair business and met kids, families who had sons, I think they all were, were, had muscular dystrophy. So they went from, I was there supplying a manual chair, sure. who were then a few years later, they were going into, man, uh, into power no, chairs yeah. and then they weren't, weren't going to live much longer. And um, um, so um, I, I'd, being born with a disability, do you know any different then? Do, they, do, they, uh, do you miss those years of being able to walk and run and jump mm. and skip and have the independence or the... But you experienced all of that and had a family and kids and everything, you know, lived a full and rich life up to 35 and had all that yep. understanding when you had your injury. It's very difficult. And a chap, I spoke to a chap uh, last week or the week before, I think he's 73, 74, he's had a spinal injury. At that age. Wow. And he's grateful it didn't happen when he was younger. He's had a good full life, he said, and he was happy that it's a situation. He's a paraplegic. I don't know what he would have said if he was a quadriplegic. Mm. Um, I guess it all comes down to your perspective and, and how you view the world and if you're able to think exactly. about your situation as positive because you had the experience before mm. or because you were born with a disability and you don't yeah. know any better. It comes back to yeah. what, you know, how you view the world, I suppose. Yeah. Um, Errol, just, I suppose, one last thing. You know that we're trying to help people who've experienced spinal cord injury much more recently than you or I explore these ideas of, of meaning and purpose and what gives them um, hope in life post-injury. You've got so much experience to draw on from all of your life experience in a chair. Is there anything else that you want to share for people that are more newly injured about you know, these concepts of no, meaning no, and purpose? It's, it's, and it's probably an individual... Um, road, a journey that each one's going to go on. We've all come from one particular area of life, perhaps different, different ages, why, what, how, where and when did it happen? I heard the saying this morning, uh, recession leads to, de to depression and that's probably true because people are worrying about how they're going to survive, how they're going to get an income and I think for us uh, it's easy to get depressed. Now I don't cry as much as I used to. Every now and then I still do, very rarely now, about my wife and what's happened. So I think it's easy for people to get depressed and find it difficult to get out of bed. Um, the concerns of the body function, if we're talking about us, whether it's bowel and bladder, uh, ability to have erection or enjoy sex or meet someone, it depends on again, depending on the age of the individual that's viewing this, that a male or a female, you, am I going to be able to find a partner? Um, am I going to be able to find love? Am I going to be able to find a job? Am I going to be able to find an opportunity to 
enjoy life. And that's what life's about, is, is enjoying it. As I said, getting out of bed some days is going to be harder than others. But it's not impossible. Um, we can feel for, sorry for ourselves. Um, most of it we have to do on our own, but there is support out there. And there's opportunity to explore the world. And an incredibly good life to be lived still in spite of, Absolutely. of injury, I Absolutely, think, mate. is what I've seen from you know, witnessing yeah. Your, yeah. your life and what you've meant to me as a mentor mm. coming through mm. sport. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, Errol. Thank you, mate. I appreciate you coming and sharing your experience with us.